All right, here is the exercise we had last time. We did a little um, sort of tip calculator where as someone could put in how much their meal costs, someone could choose whether it is dine-in or carry-out, finally someone could define the quality of service and it would compute um, what their total amount was. So in other words, on a $50 meal, if it was dine-in and there was excellent service, the, uh, the total amount was 63 and change. All right. The code that we had for this looks like this. We have on the button click event, first thing we do is we check to make sure if the page is valid. In other words, uh, have all the val uh, have the validation controls detected any errors. Now again, as I said before, normally with JavaScript enabled, that wouldn't be a factor. This really, this line of code really is necessary only when Java uh, JavaScript is not enabled. Because if JavaScript was enabled, then it won't even make it to this point if there's an issue with any of the validators. Okay? The only time it makes it back to the server is if it passes the client-side validation. And therefore, the only time it would make it to here and not be valid would be if JavaScript was not enabled. But anyhow, we have that sort of at the top of each button handling event. We, we check that just on the odd chance that JavaScript was not enabled. Doesn't really do any harm if it was because the validators fire off anyhow. Um, but it, it comes in handy if it is, uh, if it is not uh, enabled. We're declaring some variables here. We grab the food cost from the text box. We look to see what has been selected. And if it's dine-in, we calculate the sales tax. We assume that there's no tip. If the service was average, we give a tip at the rate of 15%. If the service was excellent, we give the rate uh, a tip at 20%. We add them all together, and then we display the uh, in the text. Questions about any of that? The visual part of it? I, I kind of started out playing around with styling this. I didn't get too far with that before we, we got onto the coding. Um, if you have any specific questions about that, you know, we can go over them. I'm using the label uh, tag because that is a tag for accessibility. Um, probably should do that for, for all of them. Um, we have a couple validators for this one, indicating that one being a required field validator, one being a range validator that has to be within an allowable range. We don't have a validator for this. Oh, no, we do have a validator for this one. It's just underneath. Okay? To make sure that they have to pick one. And we have a validator for quality of service. Um, and remember, we, we, can, we can do that because we can define the initial value associated with that control. And if it's that initial value, then nothing has been picked effectively, and, and we give the validation there. Questions on any of that? How do you suppose we could round this answer, because if you notice, the answer was like 63.0782 or something. How can we round that answer to something that is better? You know, round it to pennies and show it as pennies. Yeah, well, you know what? I don't remember the exact syntax, but 
I'm comfortable that there's something in the framework to allow me to do that. All right. Um, when you look at something that, that is, is pretty basic or pretty common functionality, you can usually sort of assume that it's probably somewhere in the framework and, and, and look for it. Um, to be sure, on occasion, you're going to think of something that isn't, there isn't something built into the framework, but the ASP.NET framework is such a rich framework that you don't want to rush off and write your own code. Uh, we could rush out, we could write our own code for that, and it wouldn't be that hard, but again, what's the advantage of using this? It's been tested, um, it uh, allows for some consistency, and so on. Let's do a quick Google search. And I'll search for vb.net format as currency. And there very well could be several ways to do this. But, it looks like that should do it for me. So let's try that. We can run this. And if we go in and put try to remember the same parameters as we had before. I think I said $50. I think I said dine-in. And I think I said excellent. And it formats it to that. Um, question. It formatted that as dollars. Okay. And it formatted it to two decimal points. How could that be different? When, or let me put it this way. How do we get it to format? What would have to change for this to format to euros? Would this have to change on the client side or on the server side? Server side, right? Because the server is processing it and creating that. This code that we're looking at, all right, Again, whatever we're going to do is going to format it uh, based on the settings of the server. So I'm not really familiar with all the formatting for currency, but let me give you a, maybe a better example. If I was going to do display the date, it would show me the date and time. It would show me the date and time on the server as opposed to on the client because that code is running on the server. Again, it's always important to know where this code is running because that really affects you know, any number of things. All right. Now, one other thing that we did last time is we showed the debugger, which is valuable because, again, it allows us to systematically test this. All right, if it was having an answer. If I recall, I had changed something based on a question and I forgot to change it back and therefore it was giving erroneous results. Well, again, sometimes you can find your errors simply by looking at the code and staring at it, uh, but usually it's better to take some sort of uh, systematic approach where you can go in and look and see every step. And I would encourage you all to, to run the debugger and run it, few, uh, run it through a few times just as a test just to see you and make sure you understand it so when you need to use it, you're able to use it. Now, one thing I said uh, in this class is that one thing I want to stress 
is I want to stress testing your code as well. Let's look at this. How many test cases do you think we, we would need to thoroughly test this? Remember, we're going to test, we want to cover all the, you know, all the conceivable situations and we want to cover um, any, any validation issues as well. 24? 24? Yeah. I don't know. Let's, let, let's think. That, that probably sounds reasonable. Let's define them. All right. Let's define the test cases we'd have. Number one, we could test if all of them are empty. That should give an error. That should actually test for three of the four validators that those work. All right. We'd also want to test if a non-numeric field was entered. We'd want to test if a value below the allowable range for the food beverage total and if it was tested above. All right. Wow. I think I was leaning on, on that button. All right. Okay, so that's four, and this is just air conditions. All right. We actually could, if you wanted to break it down, break those down. And, and I'm going to try to kill more than one bird with a stone by, by going in and testing all three of them being empty. And I, I will allow just one test case for that instead of a test case with that one empty, a test case. I, I think that's allowable. Now, as far as the other ones go, we would want to test uh, a combination of a valid cost dine-in carry-out and then, to be real thorough, one for each of the four tips underneath that. Okay? Each of the four valid tips underneath that. So, let's see. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> You have to count them up and you can combine test cases. The point is, is you want to be very thorough about it. You want to test every possibility, you know. Wherever there is a if in your, in your code, that's a fork and that's a test case that you need. You need the, the test case to test each of the two conditions, all right. So do spend some time testing stuff valid. One of the um, assignments that you will have, I think I made it already, uh, your next assignment is to calculate the tuition. Uh, at LC. All right. Um, and if we look at that, let's go and look at, at uh, LC's tuition rates. Oh, that drives me crazy. You can't hit return. You have to actually click go. All right. You'll notice that even forgetting errors, we'll forget errors for the time being. All right. Let's just talk about legitimate cases. There's Lorain County out of county and out of state. Are those the only test cases we have? No, because if you notice there's actually three ranges for each, right? There is the one through 12 credit hour has one rule for calculation. 13 through 18 has a different rule for calculation. And 19 through 22 has a third rule. So really, even forgetting about error 
possibilities and, and error test conditions. Um, really, you need to test at very least nine. But I probably would test more than nine because I would want to test right on the border because that's where oftentimes your, your code is, has a tendency to break. All right? Um, you know, every, every now and then when you're writing code, it, should it be less than or less than or equal to? Sometimes you think and you scratch your head and, and well, that, <laughs> that's why that should be, be tested, you know. Um, so if I were testing this, I would test for each one of these probably one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for each of those, so that would be three. And I came up with the number seven, one in the middle of this range, one at the high end of this range, one at the low end of that range, one at the middle of this range, one at the high end of that range, one at the low end of that range, one at the high end or middle range, uh, of that range. So again, you know, that's about seven test cases if I counted right. And that's for just one residency type in state. You do the same thing for out of state, out of county. So that'd be like 21 test cases. Now, that may seem like a lot of testing, but really, um, thorough testing is, is really one of the things that, that makes for a good developer. That, that they, they've taken some systematic approach and thought about what they're doing testing-wise as opposed to just um, haphazardly testing and entering a few things in and seeing if it works. All right? Um, most people that develop software can write code that works some of the time, all right? That's not that big a deal, though. You want code that works all of the time, or at least as close to all, all the time as humanly possible. So to run it through a couple of test cases and to find, uh, you know, just run it through two or three test cases and see it works out, well... Well, that's a start, but you really want to go through and test it thoroughly. Um, I mean, think of, of things that software controls. You know, software controls, you know, equipment, machinery, health, uh, you know, healthcare machines, uh, air traffic. You know, software is important, right? And therefore, you want to test it thoroughly and you want to make sure that it works. And you really want to sort of enforce that as a discipline of yourself is to look, look at it and, and run it through um, rigorous set of testing. And one thing I don't ask for in this class, I may at some point, but is a test plan where you document these are the different parameters I'm going to test for. I'm going to test for this condition. I'm going to test for that condition and so on. Uh, some projects I worked on, we had, you know, lengthy test cases, you know, and, and you know, click on link A on the home page. Click on, click on link B on the home page, you know, and all that. Make sure that all works for the sort of navigational things. Then functionally we had test cases for like the calculations and the math to make sure that was, that was done correctly. Probably the, the craziest test cases I saw were for, um, I did a web, I worked as part of a team on a web project for a company that sold like chemicals. They were, you know, a chemical supply company. And this is even pre-9-11, but even then, even pre-9-11, the regulations like for shipping some of these things, because there's potential hazards involved, were, were stringent. You know, some things you couldn't ship into certain countries. Some things you could ship into certain countries, but they had to go to certain places in those countries. They couldn't just go anywhere. You couldn't, for example, ship such and such to some place in Germany. You had to send it to one of three or four authorized places, and then they would have to go pick it up. So there's all these rules, but to calculate um, shipping costs for that, the, the test plan for that, for that one aspect of the site probably dwarfed uh, the test plan for all the rest of the site combined, just because they were so, so intricate in, in, uh, you know, in the rules of, of what could be done and what couldn't be done. At any rate, um, I'm going to, you know, I want to stress that in, in class is to, to really test things uh, systematically. Debug things systematically, all right, using the debugger as opposed to just looking and, gee, I changed that line to minus one instead of plus one. I wonder if it will work, all right. Uh, 
we all feel like doing that sometime, but it's, it's best to use a systematic approach. Now, okay, we have a piece of software, we have a page that works. Um, it works in the sense that it did what we, what we asked it to do, right? It followed the requirements. In other words, we can enter in a dollar amount within a certain range, it validates that, it then charges the appropriate sales tax if needed, and it uh, calculates the tip if needed. All right. Now, one of the points of today's class, one of the prime points of today's class is just because software works doesn't make it good. All right. And we'll talk about some of the things that, that sort of elevate software from just working to being a good piece of software. All right. One of them is, is A, making sure it really does work. You know, uh, it doesn't just work some of the time, hence the whole discussion on testing. One of the things that is a factor would be its fault tolerance. In other words, what happens if I enter in something that's not numeric? Does it blow up or is the error handled uh, in a reasonable way? And we controlled that through the validation. All right, we made sure that they couldn't enter a non-numeric value and we made sure they had to pick an option in each of the two other selections. So, you know, thoroughly tested, fault tolerant. We'll talk more about fault tolerance later on when we get into data, actual database work. All right, but for now, our, our validation serves as, as, as our fault tolerance. Besides those two things, we're being very thoroughly tested and fault tolerant. What's another factor that would make one program better than another program? Yes. Maintainability. Maintainability. Yeah, it's like, wow, what a setup. You know, if you guys did get this one, I, I don't know, we would, would have to go back to square one or something. Maintainability. Now, maintainability has a cousin. I don't remember if it's on its mom or dad's side or what, but maintainability does have a cousin, and that is reusability. All right? Code that is reusable lends itself to, to maintainability. All right? Now, let's look at the code we wrote, and let's assess the reusability of it. Then we can you know, assess the maintainability of it as well. But let's look at the, at the reusability of it. The code to do this calculation is part of the button click event on that button. Is that good or bad for reusability? That's bad for reusability, right? That means that this code can only get called when someone presses this button on this web page. All right? That is about, you know, that's the total opposite of reusability. This code only works in this one instance. All right? And that's not good. All right? We can, we can do better than that. And we can, by making some changes, we can uh, make this so this code is reusable. Now again, to be sure, this is just sort of a goofy little calculation. Um, but again, it would extend to, to bigger sort of business problems too. Shipping fees, uh, that sort of thing. All right? So if this code had to exist on another page, what would I have to do? I'd effectively have to have a copy of this code that lived in that other page as well. What happens if we change something? What happens if the tax rate changes or if we decide to tip 21% if it's good service or something like that? Well, then we'd have to change it in every place. So this is not very reusable. In fact, it's so un unreusable that we can't even call that code elsewhere on this page. 
The only way we can invoke that code is by pressing a button, pressing that specific button. So if we had some other controls over here, uh, another form or whatever, we couldn't call that code. All right, we couldn't call that code. So, how are we going to make this reusable? All right. Did you make a function and then call the function? Yeah. Our first step will be to make a function and then call the function from the button click event. Now, that's not going to be our end goal here. We're going to do more than that, but that'll be our first pass. The whole process of taking code that works and making it better is called refactoring. And think of refactoring as being like, um, like rewriting a paper for like an English class. If you write a term paper, you know, for your English class. There aren't too many people that can just sit down and write a paper from beginning to end and get it perfect, right? It, most English teachers will say one of the keys to being a, a, a good writer, an effective writer, is to revise your work. Look at it, read it, revise it. See, how can I word this more convincingly? How can I make this point more clear? And so on. Well, we have a little bit different goals in programming, but the idea is the same. Very few people can come up with the perfect solution first time through. But, once you come up with a solution, there's some criteria we have. How reusable it is, how maintainable it is, and we can look at ways to improve it. Again, I definitely encourage you not to try to do everything in one shot, but to take a shot at it, get it working, and then look to see how you can improve it. All right, and that's a better approach. So the one way we're going to improve this is we're going to break it off into a function. All right. Can someone define what a function is in this context? What the Mm -hmm. uh, a sub procedure that returns a value. All right, that that's a good uh, definition. A function, uh, another way to put it, a function is a set of code. All right, a section of code, a set of code that takes some input values in. All right, does its thing, and then returns a result. I should say optionally on a couple of those things. Optionally it can take some arguments in and optionally it can return a result. All functions don't have to do either of those, but usually they do. Usually they take arguments or often they take arguments and usually they, they return a result. Now, functions are meant to be uh, black boxes. And black boxes is an old term from engineering and what that relates to is for someone to use the black box, or in our case the function, you should only need to know the name of the function, what you need to give the function, and what the result is going to be. In other words, what kind of result you're going to get. Are you going to get a number? Are you going to get a string? Are you going to get a Boolean, a true or false? You know, what are you going to get? Anyone using the function, now this is distinct from the person creating the function, but anyone using the function should only need to know those things. What's the function called? What do I have to give it? What am I getting back? For example, that mammoth shipping calculation that, that we, we talked about uh, before. All right. We had a team of about four or five people, if I recall correctly, around four people. And really one person's job was to create effectively that function, effectively the shipping class, the, the international shipping class or, or function. And he worked on that while the rest of us did everything else in, in the project. All right. Now, when he was done, <laughs> do you think he wanted to explain to each one of us exactly how that function worked inside? No. And you know what? We didn't want to know. All right? If the function is well written, us, other people that are using that function, don't need to know the details of what it does in, in, inside. What we need to do is know what we have to give it. So maybe we have to give the name of the chemical that we want to ship. Maybe we have to give 
the weight that we want to ship and maybe we have to give the country that we want to ship it to. And then that function will return an answer that says the cost to ship that is such and such dollars or something along those lines. All right. So we give the known input The function does its thing and produces some output. Now, I'm going to use a, a word here. Um, functions ought to be what are called untethered, all right, or, or loosely coupled. What do I mean by that? A function should be self contained. That is, let's say this is the function on our page. All right, this is a function on our page. And our page has a text box and radio buttons and so on. The function should be self-contained, which means that everything it needs should be given to the function as an argument or live inside the function. And the function shouldn't worry about other stuff that's on the page. Should be assumed that it has no knowledge of what else is on the page. Yes? Is that like encapsulation? Yeah, in a way that, yeah, that, that, that's, if that's not exactly encapsulation, it's very closely related to encapsulation. Everything about that is in there. Let me, uh, let me, let me make a, a quick function. All right, we're going to do this in passes, as I said. Let me do a quick function, and we'll talk about what's wrong about the function. All right? And what limits its reusability. Again, when we talk about what's wrong with it, we're talking about what keeps it truly from being uh, loosely coupled, uh, what truly keeps it from being a real black box, and so on. So let's say I do this in, in the code. Calculate total. VB makes a distinction between a subroutine and a function. A uh, function has to return a value. A, a subroutine doesn't have to, or doesn't return a value. In most other languages, they're just all called functions. And it, there's a function that returns a value versus a function that doesn't. But VB makes that, uh, make, uh, distinguishes between the two. Now, all right, I made it into a function. Why is this still not good? It's hooked to everything else on the page. All right? I really didn't gain anything by doing this. Because if I tried to put this function on another page, all right, that other page would have to have a text box called TXT Food. Right? It would have to have a drop down list called drop down list one. It would have to have radio buttons called radio button list one or whatever is very tightly coupled, very tightly hooked into that page. And finally, my answer, I would have to want to put in that label. Maybe I'm not putting the answer in a label. Maybe I'm doing a calculation and doing something else with the result. All right? A good function does its job and only that. That is, a good function, all right, 
doesn't worry about where the data is coming from and doesn't worry about where the output is going to. It accepts the inputs that it needs from the outside world, it does its calculation, then it reports its results. And whatever the calling code, wherever the calling code has to get the values it needs, or wherever the calling code um, does with the answer, that's not really something that, that ought to be built into the function. So now what we're going to do is we're going to write this as a function and we're going to remove any references to the page from within this function. And we're going to pass everything to this function as arguments. Okay? Now, arguments are the parameters or the input values that this function is going to need to do its job. So, to calculate the total cost given this scenario that we devised, what are the parameters or what are the arguments that this function is going to need? Food cost? Pardon me? Well, we're going to need, we're going to, need to know whether it was dine-in or carry-out to calculate the sales tax and the rating of the service, you know, how good was the service. So that'll be the three arguments that, that, that we'll give. So, I'll say arg food as double arg dine in as string and finally arg service as string. Now, these are just names I made up, right? And when I call the function, I'm going to give it these three values. So up here, where I'm calling the function, I'm going to give it those three values. And whatever values I'm going to give are going to get plugged into these variables. So these variables are just sort of going to be placeholders for the actual values that are going to get passed to it. Alright? Last thing I have to do is I have to say as double to indicate that this function returns a double. All right? These things taken together are called the signature of a function. The name of the function along with the arguments that it gets and along with the return value are called the signature of the function. Now again, this being VB, this is a strongly typed language. And what that means is we have to define the types of those things as well. So we have to say that we're giving it a string. We have to say we're giving it a double. And so on. Alright. So, now, instead of saying the food cost equals txt food, the food cost equals to what? The argument that we got passed in. Arg food. Instead of testing radio button list one dot selected value, what are we going to test? We're going to test our dine in. And then finally, instead of testing drop down list one, we are going to test our service. Mm-hmm. No. I just don't know that everyone in this class has seen them, so I don't want to go uh, don't want to go over them for that reason. Okay. All right. Now, when I'm done, remember I don't want to put it back up in that label because who knows what I want to really do with it. So I'm simply going to return that double. All right. So, now I fix my function. My function is no longer looking at specific things on that page. Right? So that means that I could call this function theoretically from somewhere else. All right? By giving it different values for that parameter and getting those values from a different place. 
You know, I could use a random number generator to generate the cost of the food and test that. Or I could have a drop down with, you know, the price of the food, 10, 15, 20, 25, and that wouldn't affect this function at all. Because this function doesn't know anything about the page that it's living on. All right? It just knows it's getting these three fields, it's doing its calculation, and it's returning the result. Now, I have to call that function. All right? And here, I'm going to refer to, uh, here, the, the, the code that calls this function has two responsibilities. It has to gather up all the input parameters that this function needs, then it has to do something with the result. So, I'm going to dim result as double. I'm going to say result equals calculate total and I need to give it the different values. Well, where am I going to get the value for the food cost? That's going to be text food dot text. Where is the value of the um, dine in come from? That is going to be radio button list one dot selected value. Finally, where is it going to get the quality of service from drop down list one dot selected value? All right. So I now have to do something with that result. I've called the function. I'm storing the result in the variable, but that's not enough. All right, I have to do something with that function. And what am I going to do with it? Or I'm, I'm sorry, I have to do something with that result. I want to put that in label one text equals format result slash currency. So if I run this, it should look the same. All right. But we're positioning ourselves to make our code way more maintainable. All right. Let's go and run this. So I'll go in and I'll remember my test case, or one of my test cases, and it comes up with the same result. All right. Now, if you're not clear about how functions work, um, I would suggest take the time to study this example or examples like this and even run it through the debugger. We can do that to see exactly what happens. So let's go and let's put a breakpoint here. All right. So when this gets hit, um, it'll, it'll flip into debug mode and we can trace through and we can see everything that's happening. So, I run this, I put in my values, I'm now there, okay, I am about to call the function, remember that when debugger highlights a line, it's about to call it, it hasn't called it yet. So. It's going to take the value of textbook text, which is 50. You can see as I put my mouse over that, the little bubble help shows the value. Selected value is D. Selected value of that is E. And if I hit F11, that steps into the function. So if I want to go actually go into the function and trace the function through, I can hit F. 11, which I'll do. So now it's calling the function. And if you notice, arg food now has a value of 50. Arg dine in has a value of D. And arg service has a value of E. So those arguments that I called the function with simply get substituted in order. That first argument 
whatever value that argument has gets put in the first argument of the function. And the second, the second, the third, the third. So now our food has the value of 50 and the other ones have their value as well. And I can trace through this function as it does its thing and does its calculation. Here at the very end, it did the calculation of that and comes up with a value of 63.0875. It then returns it. Now, that result variable has a value of 63.08, uh, whatever, 75. And we format that result to be currency and we set the text equal to that. And if we look, There we have it in the text. It's important to understand how that works with the values uh, that get passed into it and the values that come out uh, of it. Now again, these variables here, arg food, that variable is only valid inside this function. right? I can't access that outside the function. Likewise, any of these variables are only available inside that function. Any communication between what's going to call this function, all right, and the function itself is going to be done either through the arguments that get passed or the return value, all right. So this guy, this method up here doesn't know anything about the variables inside of it. This guy should know about any of the variables inside this function or about anything on the page. It only knows what it gets passed and what it has inside and it returns its answer back um, to whoever called it. Whoever calls this function then is responsible for gathering up all the input parameters, calling the function, and then doing what's necessary with the results. Now, you might say to yourself, well, I thought he said that the functions shouldn't have anything to do with the items on the page. All right. This function obviously still points to txt, uh, food text, radio button list. Well, at some point you got to glue stuff together. All right. You have to glue our user interface code, which is the page, the .aspx, and so on, with what I'll call our business logic. And this would be an example of our business logic. You have to connect those two. And the events are a way to connect those two. But notice, this really doesn't do anything with them except gather them and call the function. There's no real processing done with this. So my event handlers are going to address different pieces of my code or different pieces of the page and call these functions. But the event handler is typically going to be very small. All right? It's sort of the boss function. It gets the input and delegates it to other functions to do its job. So there could actually be several functions in this chain that get called. It would call them in turn, but it doesn't actually do the work itself. It doesn't actually do the calculation. It gets the input, calls a function, does something with the result until all is said and done. Any questions about this? I, I can't stress enough the, the need to really understand what goes on in functions. Um, believe me, um, you know, I've taught this class for a number of years and a fair number of students um, have issues with functions and really, really don't really get what's going on and they'll ask me questions like, oh, so I can say it equals food cost up here. No, food cost is declared inside that function. You can't get to it out here. The only way you can get to the function is via the arguments and the return values. So be sure you understand simple examples like this, all right, um, in terms of creating the function, calling the function, and then doing something with the results. Yes? Can you do a function within a function? Within a function? Oh, absolutely. Uh, for example, maybe a better way to do this would be calculate total. I could actually do this. 
Um, I could actually split this down into three functions. And what I could do is something like this. Oh, I didn't want to do that. And then here, instead of having this code in here, I could say sales tax equals calculate tax and then I'll pass to that what it needs to do its job. And what does it need to do its job? It needs to know the price of the food and whether it was dine-in or not. So I'm sort of chaining these functions together. In fact, and then I could do the same thing with calculate tip. Don't mind me. I'll be done in a second here. All right, now look look what I'm doing here. All right. I call the function to calculate the total. The total knows what it needs to calculate the total, right? It needs those three things. But it doesn't actually do the work itself. It delegates that to another function. And it, ca it calls this calculate tax function to calculate the sales tax. It calls the calculate tip function to call the tip. It takes the results from all of those, adds them together, and that's the total. That's actually a very good thing to do, all right? Because the smaller a function is, the more single purpose a function is, the greater chance it has to being reusable, all right? We may only want uh, code that uh, calculates the sales tax on something. All right? We may not ever want to calculate all of it together. We might want to calculate the sales tax separate from everything else. Well, we now have the ability to do that. 
or we can calculate the total. All right. So there are uh, a lot of advantages to breaking it down. Um, the one thing I've heard is that a, um, a, a good function, a couple signs of a good function, um, it should be visible on the screen all at once. You should be able to see the top and bottom of the function all at once. Now again, I'm in a little bit bigger print, but let's go back to like normal size. All these functions, I can see the beginning and end. The thought is, is if you have to scroll up and down, you might lose track of things as a coder. If you can see it all, you can sort of get your head around it all at once. The other sign uh, that a function is good is if you can summarize what it does in one, uh, uh, um, one function without like using the word and. For example, a function that says calculate tip and a function that says calculate tax is better than a function that says calculate tax and tip. All right? Because a function that calculates tax and tip, you have to calculate them together. Whereas one that does one, you can, you can call it if you only want to call that. If you want to call both, you can call both. So yeah, this actually is even, even more maintainable than uh, uh, the original example I had. Yes? Repeat that, please. Yes. Each function you have to declare its own arguments. So, in other words, right. Right. Well, I am saying it's double here, though, when I declared that function. So, for example, I'm, I'm, calling, I'm calling all the, I'm using a consistent naming for, for the arguments. If I call this arg food x and dine in x, all right, I could still call it because what that's saying is take the arg food argument that this function call, uh, got and pass it to this function. And then I could call it that, you know, it's just a coincidence that I'm calling it arg food in the other function. I could call it by another name. All right, so when you declare the function, you identify the type of the variable it is. When you call it, you have to match that type, but you don't have to match the name at all. I just, for readability, I, I uh, did that. I, I guess I shouldn't say it's a coincidence, because it's not really a coincidence, but it's not, not a requirement. So let's go in and, and let's go and make sure this works. In fact, let's go and, let's make sure it works. We'll come back and we'll, we'll run debugger on it so that we can really trace it through. So we go in 50, dine in. Ooh. We have a problem. Now, I could stare at the code. All right. Oh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into debug mode. All right, let's go and run this. You see, I'm so good that I can make these little mistakes without you folks even noticing until we go to run it. And then, then we have a good thing to discuss here in class. Yeah, I know what I'm doing too. <laughs> I wasn't a coincidence I was off by $50, right? But at any rate, let's go and look this. And as we go through debug, we can hit F11. All right. My button click event calls this. I declare some variables. I call sales tax equals calculate tax arg food arg dine in. I'll hit F11. It's now going to go into that function and it's going to 
calculate the sales tax and return it. And now I'm back up here. It returned the value for the sales tax and that gets put into my sales tax variable. So I popped down into that function, it did its thing, returned the result back and that got put in to the sales tax. Now I'm doing this, going to do the same thing with tip. Oops. Actually I hit F10. Uh, that, that's a step over so it didn't show me going into the function. But it went into the function, it did its calculation and calculated $10. Now total cost equals food cost, ooh, which is zero. Yeah, that should have been changed to arg food. All right, that should have been changed to arg food and I did not. So I can go in and stop debugging. And I can change that to arg food now. Oops. And this should work. It's tracing it through. And there, it gives me the correct results. All right. So we really broke this down. And, and that, uh, let, let's make a couple key observations here. First of all, um, and these are just general rules. More smaller functions are generally better than fewer big functions. Because fewer big functions typically combine a couple things into one. And you're better off, you, you get yourself uh, more reusability if you break things down to just really one very basic piece of functionality. And you can tell that by the name of the function. You know, if it doesn't have the word and in it, there's a chance it might be good. All right? And based on the size of it. If it gets to be much longer than the size of your screen, um, that should be a caution as well. You're going to have two kinds of functions. All right? You're going to sort of have the user interface functions, which sort of are the glue, which take your user interface and tie it to the um, business uh, logic or the business uh, functions. And those sort of glue functions are okay to refer to other stuff on the page because they're not meant to be reusable. All right? This function here, I don't care, I'm not worried if I never reuse this function. Because it's a simple enough function, if I had to do this on another page, I'd write just something that looks exactly like this that would grab the values from its controls on the page and call the appropriate function. So that code doesn't really matter. It, its purpose in life is to glue that user interface to the business logic. Now the business logic, I want to be true black box functions where it only gets this input from the arguments and only outputs that because that's the stuff I want to reuse. Now the other things functions can do is functions can either really do a task like these or sort of be control functions like these. In other words, that calculate total doesn't really calculate um, any of the pieces of the total. It just is a, you know, calls a series of function, boom, adds the stuff together. So that's sort of control logic, you know. The only, quote, knowledge in calculate total is that, well, your total cost is the food cost plus the sales tax plus the tip. The details of how to calculate the tip are in the tip function. The details of how to calculate sales tax are in the sales tax function. So now we've taken, we've broken it down into several functions and we've made this a lot more maintainable, all right? But we still have a flaw, all right? What's the flaw in our approach that we have here? Yeah, this function still lives on this page. It's not coupled to that page, it's not tethered to that page, 
So we're moving in the right direction, but we can't use this function on any other page, right? This function is tied to that page. So our next step is going to go and it's going to take the code, all right, from this page and put it somewhere else, someplace that can be shared. And that is, you know, custom classes, um, uh, VB classes, custom classes, whatever you want to call them. We'll, we'll create a class to put um, this code in. And then we'll be able to bring that class in anywhere we want to call this code. Uh, I guess the analogy would be like to an external CSS file. With an external CSS file, we can define the CSS code and we can bring it in anywhere where we need that CSS code. Here we're going to define our VB code and we're going to put that in a custom class and we can go and use that wherever we want to. So that will be what we will do um, next class. Thursday? All right. Now again, those of you that may have had VB or even advanced VB, maybe some of this stuff is old hat for you and maybe also you could see some ways that we could improve this further, like it was mentioned in enumeration. Um, this could be improved using constants. There's a couple other ways to do it, but I do want to make sure we at least get this much exposure to that. You know, you can pick up some of the other things in more detail as you learn more about VB, but I do at least want to cover this aspect of it. All right, we'll see you up in lab.